what an honor it is to welcome you to another NWU webinar. Today we focus on marketing and marketing management within this weird year that we find ourselves in. Uh, our theme is marketing unmasked. How do you stand out uh, in, in, this, in this strange era that we find ourselves in where most certainly our idea of marketing uh, has also gone through the COVID treatment. We are very fortunate to be uh, blessed with uh, many experts in this field at the Northwest University. And today we are uh, joined by four of them, and I'll introduce them one by one. We are also very fortunate to have the Putrestrum Chamber of Commerce on board, uh, and we have the Deputy Chair by name of uh, Joanita Greilung here. And uh, she's also the CEO of a marketing and communications company called Feisty. Uh, wonderful to have you here. Right, let's start uh, with the webinar, ladies and gentlemen. Our experts will speak on four different topics, basically their field, or at least the field that they are now doing research on and uh, where they are seen to be, as, uh, seen to be an expert. We're going to start off with a branding and target marketing as a topic. And uh, before I give the floor to Dr. Miller, ladies and gentlemen, also uh, just a reminder that you are more than welcome to pose any questions to us. Um, I can see the feed coming up uh, of all the different questions that you might ask and I'll relay them to our experts. So feel free to interact. Right, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Rian Miller is our first speaker. Uh, and Dr. Miller, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Kepia. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, as you said, I'll be uh, sharing some information with you regarding branding your organization. And I want to start off with my favorite question. What is a brand? When you usually ask people this, uh, you get answers along the lines of a logo or the name of the company, but a brand is so much more and there's so much more beneath the surface. So hopefully, after my short presentation, uh, I will give you some uh, more information regarding that. Uh, just to illustrate that point, if I put this uh, logo on the screen, I'm sure a bunch of thoughts is running through your mind as you think of this brand. Uh, usually when I ask this, question, uh, what comes to mind when you view this logo? Uh, I get answers along the lines of luxury, expensive, classy, and that is great branding. None of those words are listed on this picture here, but you immediately knew, I'm sure you knew this was Mercedes-Benz, and all of those characteristics do come to mind. I want to give you a quick, brief history lesson regarding branding. So if you were to guess how old branding is, uh, I'm not sure if your guess would be in the right region, but the term branding is not that old. It's about 4,000 years. It comes from a Viking language, Old Norse. So the term is brandr. So that literally referred to putting a mark on your cattle and saying, this is mine. And the concept of branding is actually a lot older than that. Uh, we find the first traces of branding 9,000 years ago. Now, the picture I'm zooming in here now is a picture of a clay pot uh, that was used to store olive oil in. And the clay pot got certain markings on it, and the farmer used the markings to indicate to the buyers that the olive oil is from his farm. So that's the brief, brief history lesson. If we turn up the dial a couple of centuries uh, forward, back in the day, you went to the market, you knew the farmer who was selling you the fruit or the vegetables. You probably knew where his farm was. You trusted the farmer. But then came the industrial revolution and big supermarkets. Now the consumers didn't know the farmer anymore. They didn't know where the products were coming from anymore. So organizations realized we have to create a brand. 
that people can relate to, that they can trust. And that's also the reason why some of the first recorded brands are people or named after people, Uncle Ben's, Aunt Jemima, Dr. Brown's. It was to create this sense of a person that people can really trust. Now I'm moving uh, in the region of communication. Uh, Kepi, I know this is your field of expertise actually. In communication, you've got a sender and a receiver. And in marketing, it's actually the same thing. You as a brand need to get your message across to your target market. Now we do that by means of marketing and by means of branding. And if you do it right, you will uh, get income in return or consumers will come and buy from you. It sounds easy enough, but the problem is nowadays we are competing with so many different brands out there and we need to find a way to break through the platter. And this is where branding fits in. Uh, but before I get to branding, I briefly wanna to touch on target marketing because at the end of the day, you really need to know your target market. You need to know who they are, so that you can start building a relationship with them. Now at the Northwest University, specifically the Vol, uh, Vol campus, we've got a whole research focus area doing a lot of research regarding generation youth, as we call them, or some people refer to generation Y. We are focusing on new consumers going into the marketplace. Uh, research found these consumers are very materialistic, status conscious. They like to use product reviews uh, to determine their decisions. They are also environmentally friendly, fascist con uh, fashion conscious, and they hold a strong global identity, just to mention a few things. But let's look at my focus area, which is brand personality. I wanna invite you to think outside the box. I don't know if you're familiar with Johnny Walker Blue Label. Now, those of you who's not, this is a rather expensive bottle of whiskey. You'll pay around about two and a half thousand grand a bottle. Now let's imagine that person were to walk through the door where you're currently at. How would that person look? What would they act like? I'm sure a certain person comes to mind uh, if I were to think of Johnny Walker Blue Label, this is typically what comes to mind. And this is also uh, the actor in one of the uh, adverts, a modern classic, a confident person, masculine, elegant, bold. On the other side of the spectrum, if you were to think of Jeep, and if that person was going to walk through your door, someone like Big Rose might come to mind adventuristic, outdoorsy, rugged, tough, wild. Now, this is what brand personality is all about, creating a persona that people can start relating with, that they can start trusting. Now, if we get to the theory of brand personality, uh, this is linked to psychology and the big five personality traits of psychology. Um, theory argue that there are five different brand personality types. So, and you can group within one of these five or in more than one. So just to give you some example, we'll start off with sincerity, a down to earth, honest type of brand within South Africa, Fruit and Veg City is a good example. Um, exciting, daring, imaginative, unique. A good example is Red Bull. Then you get your more competent type of brands, reliable, intelligent, uh, confident. Santum is a good example within the South African contest. Then you also get your more sophisticated brands, upper class, uh, glamorous, good looking. We mentioned the brand earlier, Mercedes Benz. Last category is ruggedness, which is a more outdoorsy, tough, rugged type of brand. We also mentioned Jeep. Um, you don't need to necessarily group just within one of these categories. You can have a leg in more than one. A great example is the Range Rover. 
which is marketed as a sophisticated type of brand, but also with a rugged side. Another example is BMW, also marketed as sophisticated, but also with an excitement element. Now, as an organization, you need to ask yourself, where do you want to group? Uh, and you'll have to do some soul searching. If you may determine what's your vision, where do you want to be as a company? And then you need to find out, are you actually there? And this is where market research fits in. You go and find out from consumers, what is their perception regarding your brand? And if your vision and the consumer's perceptions doesn't line up, you need to start looking at your strategy and adapt accordingly. And that brings me to the conclusion of my presentation. This is my definition of branding. So branding involves the core beliefs and values of the organization concerning all the business practices and interactions with consumers. So this is not just your adverts. This is everything you do from the way you produce your product to your communications with consumers, the way you interact with your employees, everything that uh, the organization does forms part of your uh, branding and branding strategy. And that's my story. Thank you very so much. much. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, Dr. Nrala, thank you so much. That was uh, very insightful. I'm, I'm especially interested in the reciprocity between how you, how you communicate your brand, your brand personality or brand attributes, um, and the affirmation that it brings in the identity of the consumer. And then the, the reciprocity kicks in that whenever the consumer interacts with your brand, that feedback can actually help you to redefine the identity of your brand. In fact, we, we had a question that relates to that brand communication, how you live out the brand personality. Uh, someone here asked, um, uh, what do you think would be the correlation or the impact between brand communication and the, the brand itself? This person refers specifically to uh, startups uh, and mentions the, the example of uh, a typo, a typing error in their brand communication. Uh, they might not have all the resources to check up, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a mistake goes out. What, what harm does that do to the brand? All of this is interconnected when it comes to your brand communications. And yes, mistakes happen. And I tend to think that is not necessarily a bad thing. It shows consumers that you are human. It shows them that uh, you also do make mistakes. And I think the most important aspect regarding your brand communications is just to stay true to your brand values. So whatever you are communicating to your consumers, just stay true to the values, even though if there's a mistake that slips through the cracks, if the core message is true to your brand values, I don't think that would be harmful to the brand. Uh, thank you so much, Rian. Uh, Ioannita, I'd, I'd like to ask you about this as well. Um, from, from a more practical side, when you, when you help with brand communication and living out a brand and so on, when, when you work with uh, the, the people uh, you work with, um, how do you approach brand values, brand personality, and actually what is said uh, in advertising and in marketing uh, about the brand? I think the most important thing for a brand to remember is to be authentic and to be real. Like Rian said, um, to use open communication. You are human, you're going to make mistakes, but um, you can actually communicate that. Um, if there's a mistake, um, man up and tell them that you are sorry and use open communication with your target audience. Um, because people like to do business with people and you're not a robot, you're going to make mistakes. Um, so with regards to that, um, I believe that that is my answer when it comes to being authentic. Because when you are authentic, you're, you focus on what your brand's vision is, what your values are, your look and your feel, as well as your tone and your, um, tone of voice. And the important thing is when you use your marketing um, tools, you, sh you should focus on um, portraying that to your target audience. 
That confirms what uh, Dr. Miller also said, Dionita. Thank you so much. I, I love it when we start talking about marketing and communication steps in. Uh, Dr. Miller alluded to my love of communication science, and, and one of the sub-codes in nonverbal communication is olfactory communication. It has to do with smells and fragrances and so on. And that's actually where we're heading off next in the world of marketing, uh, something called scent marketing. I was fascinated to hear about this uh, Dr. Roland Goldberg. He's our expert on it. And I can't wait to hear a little bit more about it. Dr. Roland, we are in your hands. Thank you, Gepia. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. Just a very brief introduction of myself. I am a senior lecturer in marketing at the Northwest University. And my focus areas in research include, um, predominantly include city and place marketing, um, as well as segmentation. And then a new, very exciting avenue I'm pursuing is retail atmospherics and that encompasses uh, scent marketing. Now I was actually thinking about my topic this morning when I was driving to the shops and I came across a fellow about flyers. Now firstly I was quite flabbergasted, he's very optimistic to think that consumers will reach out and take a flyer during this time of the pandemic running the risk of catching the virus maybe. But more shockingly was that um, there are, to think that there are still companies and marketers out there that think the, the vehicle, this vehicle of marketing is still effective. I mean, when last, is a, when last did you guys take a flyer, read through the content and actually enact upon that message? I usually just uh, say no, thank you. Or if I feel really bad for the guy dishing out the flyers, I would just go around the corner and crumble it up and throw it in the bin. Especially if it's those small flyers, those black and white or blue and white flyers. I'll just chuck it in the bin. Um, and then on my way back, I came across a billboard and usually I would just drive past it. But now because I'm focused on, on this whole topic of, of marketing and the, and the various vehicles of marketing, um, I realized that the first or, or, or second or third time I drove past that billboard, I must have realized or noticed the message on that billboard. But what happened was the fifth or the sixth time you drive past that billboard, you actually become used to that message and you don't take note of it anymore, especially company doesn't change that advertisement to appeal to, to your, your senses and to, to penetrate that, that perceptual buzz of yours. And then the 10th or the 11th time you drive past it, you don't notice that message at all. Um, now, the reason for this is because of perceptual blocking or um, consumers becoming used to the exposure of this advertisement as well as that what we call selective exposure or selective perception. Now, I always use the, I, this example when explaining this concept to my students is, let's say you're driving from Johannesburg to Cape Town and you start feeling queasy as you enter Colesburg because of some dodgy pie you maybe ate on your journey earlier. Um, and then as you're driving into the town, you're really feeling ill. So you are not going to take note of um, marketing messages that, that you don't need. Like, for example, if you're feeling queasy, you're not going to take notice of um, fast food advertisements or fashion outlet advertisements, but your focus is going to be on that of medical treatment. It might be a doctor or a pharmacy like Clicks or, or Discam. Um, so that is what we call selective exposure, and you're going to ignore the rest. So in order to combat this for us as marketers, in order to penetrate the consumer's perceptual vibe, one needs to think bigger, better, and totally out of the box, especially in this time, um, during this, this COVID time, where one really needs to stand out and make a statement to gain market share. Remember, during this time, consumers have very limited resources, um, so they will be very careful where and how they spend these resources. Fact of the matter is that traditional methods and vehicles of marketing have become totally redundant and ineffective. Um, this morning, I was actually in a consultation with one of my friends. Uh, he has a very um, nice restaurant that he started here in, in Pachestrum, and he wants me to do the marketing for them. And the first thing I asked him is, where are you marketing? And these, these traditional vehicles came up, newspaper, flyers, things that are totally redundant at, at the moment. And if the person is a bit more savvy, he'll say social media, like Facebook and Instagram. But even these vehicles are becoming ineffective, especially if your target market is not well-defined. 
Um, so we need to become more strategic in a sense and, and penetrate the subconscious levels of our consumers. Now, appealing to the consumer senses is obviously the primary method we as marketers use to get our message across. I mean, you look at advertisements on television or in a magazine or a newspaper, or you listen to a YouTube advertisement or advertisement on the radio. Um, but the ideal is to, to start going beyond that because it is just not working anymore. The ideal today is also to appeal to multiple senses, but my focus is on, on the scent marketing, on, on, on the smell marketing, and, and we refer to that in the industry as smarketing, where we appeal to a consumer's sense of smell. So through various research studies I've conducted on this topic, we have come to realize that consumers tend to make certain brand associations with specific smells. Um, when one smells a specific aroma, you link that to a brand and this then aids uh, um, a recall, brand recall. It also allows you to lure in consumers to, to, to your shop or to your product. Um, for example, I was in Poland a while ago and even though I wasn't hungry, I was walking past a, a stand that was selling um, peanuts, uh, cinnamon coated peanuts. And just that smell lured me and all of a sudden I was like, no, I have to taste this because it smells so good. And another example is Mercedes-Benz produces their own aromas or perfumes. Um, now, this is not the, the, the aromatic air freshener that you hang from your mirror that you buy at a, a car wash or pick and pay, but it's a very unique smell that the brand has produced um, and manufactured. And then these perfumes are available for sale at Mercedes garages or retail outlets where you can actually spray the smell on you as, as, as a perfume but they also put this smell in the vehicle's cubby hole where there's a diffuser system and they diffuse the smell uh, when, you, when, you, when you put on the, the air conditioner throughout the vehicle. And what this allows the consumer to do is associate the specific smell to the specific brand. In South Africa, the Fire and Ice Hotels, I think there's about three or four now, they also produce their very unique smell or a very unique aroma. So when you go into a fire and ice hotel lobby or the elevator, you, you smell this unique fire and ice smell of the hotel. Now, one of my master's students, uh, Chantal van Niekerk and I, have recently conducted a study to determine how scent, how smell affects consumer behavior and more specifically their decision-making process. We conducted our study amongst consumers of high-end fashion stores like Gucci, Hugo Boss, Louis Vuitton and all those uh, snazzy upmarket boutiques or retail outlets and the results were absolutely phenomenal. We found and confirmed that smell aids brand association and recall but by implementing the Moravian Russell model we found that it also subconsciously affects a consumer's approach or avoidance behavior. Do they enter a store or do they walk past it? We also found that a pleasant aroma improves browsing times and also increases the likelihood that a consumer will purchase a product or service or not. We are also now looking at various strategies of how fashion brands can appeal to um, a multiple senses, which, which is ideal, but it is extremely difficult. Um, I was in London some time ago, uh, I think it was 2008, 2017, where they had a New Year concert called Dazzle the Senses. And this was just marketing at a whole next level. So when you enter the arena or the, the section that was cordoned off, you were handed a packet of fruit sweets. And in this packet, you had uh, strawberry flavors, banana flavors, black currant. And uh, as you enter, the, the, this whole process will start. Like they will, it was at the London Eye, so they'll throw uh, or, or portray an image, for example, of a big strawberry on the London Eye. And then at the back, pink or red uh, fireworks will be going off. And then they'd ask you to eat your strawberry sweetie. And they had big set smell machines that would um, throw or, or, or squirt out a very pungent strawberry smell or scent into the crowds. So, so this was indeed dazzling the senses. You had this, the, the sense of uh, um, smell being affected, the sense of taste being affected, and also visually um, seeing this, this image of a strawberry. It was absolutely phenomenal. And I think that's what brands um, are aiming towards is affecting most of the senses of a consumer. So yes, that is one of the more exciting areas of research in which I'm currently specializing. 
that is indeed groundbreaking research for South Africa as research concerning scent marketing and the effect it has on South African consumers has never been conducted. So um, it's indeed, indeed groundbreaking. One of these retailers that we included in our study um, already are buying into the idea and have now opted to determine the specific scents consumers associate and prefer in specific retail outlets, like they prefer very hygienic um, chlorine type of smell in a health uh, outlet like a pharmacy. And we found that they prefer very heavy aromatic scents like a bergamot or cherry and plum for upmarket fashion stores. So if anyone is interested in finding out more about my research and possible avenues to pursue regarding scent marketing or smarketing, I'm your guy. You, you can most definitely contact me for more information. Thank you. Thank you, Hirpia. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. You, the uh, uh, smarketing thing, <laughs> I think I'll try and employ it at home and see if I can persuade a few of my family members <laughs> by just the smell. Uh, Dr. Goldberg, uh, you've at the uh, uh, at the offset of your uh, your presentation now, uh, you've mentioned a few very specific uh, things in marketing. You know, just the like the pamphlets at the uh, at the at the crossing. Um, we've had a question here on coupons, and I'd like you to comment a little bit on on your idea of the effectiveness effectiveness of coupons. Is it still a thing? I'll give you a moment uh, just to contemplate. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say the same to you, Anita. You, Anita, we have a question here. Uh, you've mentioned that people uh, uh, like doing business with people. And the question we had here was, uh, uh, what happened now during COVID? Uh, we've seen a lot more digital marketing. Um, and, and what about our necessity or our need or our desire to interact with people when it, when it comes to marketing? Um, but Dr. Roland, uh, first back to you on, on the coupons thing. What, what is your opinion on this? Yes, uh, coupons, especially during the time of COVID, is very effective. I mean, um, a lot of people had a financial knock during the, the pandemic period. So as you become more frugal, you are going to find uh, or seek avenues or methods of, um, of, of, of decreasing your expenditure or even having um, a promotional or, or a percentage discount on, on the amount. Yes, um, uh, coupons is most definitely effective, but you should also know your target audience. The other day I received a, a coupon in, in my inbox, in my email inbox of sanitary uh, products. And I mean, if you know your target audience, you're going to send those coupons and those marketing messages to a specific very niche market or segment. So, one should be very careful uh, in doing that because, I mean, you're spending a lot of your resources, your company resources in creating those coupons. So, too, you should spend a lot of resources to identifying the consumers to, which, to whom you're sending those coupons. But overall, I think uh, a most effective strategy in the current situation, yes. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg, our expert in scent marketing. Uh, Joanita, do you have an answer for me? How, uh, how do we respond to this question on people like doing business with people? Well, the thing is here, Pia, I believe that um, we should focus on using a multi-channel marketing mix and people still want to see people behind the business. So what's going on behind the scenes in your company? Who is the people working for you? Um, and this is how you also build customer relationships because you are honest about what's going on in your business. You are showing the people behind the scenes and people um, start to get to know you better. So that is a, is a way to um, build brand loyalty. And it's, it also takes me back to brand um, authenticity. Um, you need to show photos of your employees and um, when you are behind the scenes, I know there's a lot of people that work from home, but there was a lot of, um, photos and videos taken from people meeting and in chat rooms, busy with their meetings and still making sure that the target audience is aware of what is happening at the company, um, that they are still operating and they can still um, serve in all their target audience's needs. So that is very important and that is where the people want to do business with people comes in. Thank you so much, Yonita. Appreciate that. Um, uh, we've heard now the experts speak and they, they constantly refer back to the consumer and, uh, and understanding what the consumer is all about. Uh, I want to pose this question to all the experts, but 
uh, not to answer now. I'll give you some uh, uh, time to think of, of it because uh, it, it is a difficult question. There's a question here on the whole clicks adverts. Uh, was it handled well? Uh, how should it uh, have been handled, etc.? We'd like to get your opinion on that. But before we get to that, back to the consumer and the customer. Uh, on the, the theme of customer citizenship, we are now going to listen to Dr. Mia Botma. Uh, Dr. Mia, uh, we've spoken before and I've said to you uh, uh, the whole idea of what the consumer does, thinks, acts, uh, a brand ambassador, et cetera. Uh, perhaps I'm hoping it all relates to customer citizenship, but you promised to tell us a little bit more about it. Yes, thank you very much, um, Gepia. I'm just gonna share my screen with you as well. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity and good afternoon to all the prospective graduate students and also industry role players. Um, just also a quick introduction from my side. Uh, my name is Mia Botma. I'm also part of the School for um, Management Sciences, specifically in the program of marketing at the NWU. Um, I lecture undergraduate modules um, that includes introduction to marketing and integrated marketing communication. I also have worked in practice for about 14 years. And concerning my research interests, um, includes um, citizenship behavior, commitment, branding, relationship marketing, and also relationship marketing, which is also part of customer citizenship behavior and also customer behavior. But if you think about your social network sites, and I've posted some um, examples, I'm sure you all have seen comments and questions on social media sites. Things like, I had the best breakfast at Mug and Bean. Where can I color my hair? Normally they also ask, that doesn't cost an arm and a leg. Um, also posts such as, have you, have you seen the latest specials at the iStore? Some of you might have even posted or have commented on posts like that. Maybe you had to assist your parents or friends um, to use their new smartphone um, or help them with their online banking app. Now, all of these behaviors are known as citizenship behavior and specifically my focus, customer citizenship behavior, taking place within the online and also offline environment, but my focus predominantly on the online environment um, with reference to online communities and also online retailing. Now, if I can just give you a little bit of theory um, where customer citizenship fits into the marketing field of marketing, citizenship behavior is part of the co-creation process. Um, co-creation refers to the combined cooperative and concurrent process where organizations and customers generate value through interaction. The co-creation process um, includes co-production, which is, takes place prior to consumption or purchase, and includes activities such as designing new products, assembly of products, or providing new product ideas. Customer value co-creation um, includes participation as well as citizenship behavior. So that's where citizenship behavior fits in. Participation is viewed as required behaviors. It normally takes place during consumption or purchase and includes activities such as placing your order or obviously doing your payment. Where citizenship behavior is voluntary behavior. And that's what's very important to understand citizenship behavior. It's voluntary, it's not required, but it's helpful to both the organization and to individuals. Citizenship um, behavior, as I, as I said, is also referred to as extra role behaviors, such as advocacy, where you recommend an organization um, or a brand to other customers, helping behaviors where you, where you, for example, reply on Facebook with the telephone number of, your lo of a local doctor, um, or where you even assist your mother to install her FMV app on a new smartphone. Um, even wearing branded clothes are seen as citizenship or type of citizenship behavior. 
And as I said, it can be performed offline where you physically face to face assist somebody or make a suggestion or make a recommendation, but also within the online environment um, on social media sites. So where did, why does citizenship interest me? And I think it might be also be interested to you. Well, citizenship behavior actually emerged already in 1988 um, within an organizational con um, environment and was subsequently then expanded to customers. Citizenship behavior, as I said, is beneficial to both organizations and to the consumer. Um, for organizations, obviously when customers perform citizenship behavior, it doesn't cost them a cent. They only benefit from the behaviors. Um, when customers recommend the organization, their products, um, tell other customers about a positive experience they had, um, assist fellow customers to actually use the product, the, the organization benefits actually free of cost, so they don't pay for it. <clears throat> Likewise, customers also benefit. Um, Recommendation, recommendations made by fellow customers assist customers to make a purchase. So if you want to buy a product and you're unsure um, about the products, if you see recommendations specifically maybe from your friends or on Facebook, you would be more inclined to make the purchase. It's also possible to get um, quick and effective information about products um, and also about the services. More so within the current um, and post-COVID environment, citizenship behaviors by customers by, might be more important to organizations and gaining a better understanding of this concept and importantly, the factors that contribute to citizenship um, will be, will be cr um, critical. Owing to COVID, more customers are now, have now turned to online retailing and also online communities such as Facebook groups to purchase products and also get information and assistance. In addition, the interaction of individuals on social media sites have significantly increased during this time. More people are now using social media to interact with others and they use these sites to, to ask questions and make recommendations about products um, that they're currently using or that they intend to buy. So obviously then for citizenship, there is, there's various opportunities um, in terms of the research of citizenship behavior. It's a concept that has evolved and is really very popular and is, is part of specifically in the field of academics is, is part of the conversation that's actually taking place now in, in terms of marketing. Also importantly, there's a lot of research opportunities from a practical perspective to actually assist cust, uh, companies to understand the concept of citizenship behavior and importantly, how can they actually get customers to engage in these activities. Um, a concept that's also very much related to citizenship behavior is that of relationship marketing, um, already defined in 1983. Relationship marketing is defined as the continuous long-term process of attracting, maintaining, and enhancing customer relationships. As you all might be aware, it's much more costly to acquire new customers than to, to retain your current customers. Um, and therefore, relationship marketing is very relevant and essential in today's business environment. Um, research already indicated that commitment and trust, two very important and prominent um, concepts in the field of marketing. Um, commitment and trust is also underpin, um, underpins of relationship marketing and also relevant to consumer of customer citizenship behavior. Since research have already indicated that if customers are committed, they're prone to also perform citizenship behavior and the same can be said of trust. There's various other factors that also influence behavior, um, specifically customers' uh, citizenship behavior, such as brand awareness, um, loyalty, um, brand association, ease of use. So in a nutshell, that is more or less what is citizenship about, an exciting concept that is especially very important in this current turbulent business environment that organizations must survive in. 
organizations need to stand out amid the pandemic. And one way to do so is to understand customer citizenship behaviors and how these behaviors can assist organizations and customers. So if you have any more if, uh, questions that you need, you're more than welcome to email me. Also, uh, if you're interested in applying in, for a postgraduate degree, you can do so on the NW website. Um, during October, November, um, we will be working through all the applicants, so you must hurry up with your application. Um, then that's me. Thank you very much for your time. And I leave you with this quote. People don't buy goods and services. They buy relations, stories, and magic. Thank you very much, Kefia. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mia Botma on customer citizenship. Uh, briefly, Mia, and uh, I think you, Anita, for you as well. Uh, we've had a question here on, on to what degree can we uh, elicit or facilitate responses that would uh, basically embody the idea of uh, customer citizenship. Should we push uh, uh, or would it seem unethical or seem as trying too hard? Uh, Mia, I think I'll, I'll give you the first opportunity to, to respond. Um, well, that's the, the, actually the big part, um, important part of citizenship is, as I said, that it's voluntary. So it's not really a behavior that, that can be pushed upon customers. Um, they decide for themselves to actually engage in such behaviors. Therefore, it's very important to understand actually what's the antecedents of it. So what, what, what factors and what um, elements actually lead customers to perform citizenship behavior? And as I said, one of those are um, commitment. Um, a study that I completed actually indicated that when customers or even online members on a Facebook group are committed towards the, the, the group, they are more prone. So, so by enhancing and motivating commitment and getting customers committed will lead to customer citizenship behavior. The same with trust, the same if you look at a system and um, perceive usefulness, um, the level of ease of use to use the system are all kind of factors that will make customers actually perform citizenship behavior. So you can't really enforce it. You need to create situations and build those relationships so that people voluntarily actually participate and perform citizenship behaviors. That makes a lot of sense. So what you would do is in, instead of pushing hard, you, yes, you'd work yeah, on these antecedents that, you, that you've mentioned. Uh, putting a lot of things in place. Uh, and I suppose that when they then speak up, it would seem a lot more authentic, uh, the, the endorsement or the, the customer citizenship. Uh, Yonita, do you agree? I know that you've been working a little bit on, on the authentic voice uh, uh, as well. Um, yes, I can't agree more. And the thing is, if we take a look at the beginning of March until now, within the marketing landscape, we can see that it has changed dramatically and um, because of that we need to focus on relationship marketing and especially online and that is to create uh, emotional connection with your customer and that is where um, the the um, the listening and connecting factor comes in so there's a lot of different um, management tools that you can um, use to listen to your clients and your target audience in order to create that relationship, the marketing relationship with your um, customers. So there's tools like Hootsuite and HubSpot and Sprout Social that is all about the analytics, the mentions, the hashtags, the feedback, the reviews that you get from your clients. And I think um, that is a great tool to use to actually um, identify the specific needs and for them to interact and connect with your brand and with your company. And there's also a lot of, um, we've seen that the focus is, um, is shifting from just posting ads online to creating ad campaigns, paid advertising. And that is where you also can use lead generation forms that people ha has a choice either if they want to engage with the forms or not. So yes, I um, completely agree. Thank you, Yonita. We've also had a question uh, or comment here saying that in these times, uh, people have found that effective algorithms 
using a hashtag and the and and the at uh, is really uh, also very effective. So I think it latches on a little bit to what you've said. Thank you, ladies. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to broaden our horizons and move to international marketing. I'm looking forward to this uh, and to hear uh, what our experts uh, have to say on international mar marketing. We are moving specifically to Dr. Ankit Katrodia. Uh, Dr. Katrodia, uh, we are in your hands. We look forward to what you have to say. Thank you and uh, welcome. Thank you for this opportunity. Myself, Dr. Ankit Katrodia, working with Northwest University Mafeking Campus, Marketing Department Lecturer. Today, I'm going to discuss about what exactly international marketing is all about? What are the fundamental concepts that play a very important role into the international marketing? So let's move to the topic. International marketing is a different than a normal marketing. It's also known as a global marketing. International marketing is a research process. It is a design, collection, and recording, analyzing, and interpretation, and reporting the information related to a particular making a company would like to operate internationally. The meaning itself says that a company would like to more than one country. It is very important for them to understand what exactly international marketing is. How it is different than a normal marketing. So these are the difference between the international marketing versus the domestic marketing. As we can see that the tools and techniques of the international research are the same in the domestic marketing, but the difference is the environment, which is the tools are applied. So as we can see that the most important difference in the domestic and international marketing is about the environmental tools, the new parameters, and a broader definition of the competition. So these three are the main element which make a difference between the domestic versus the international marketing. As we are living in a 21st century, and globalization play a very important role. And each of the businessmen, each of the entrepreneurs would like to start a business out of the home country. But before they start the business to other country, it is very important and essential to understand the difference between the operator, the difference between the currency, the difference between the government rules, regulations, policy, and if we identify those factors, which can include the first is the new parameters. In cross international border, a firm encounter a constraint not found in the domestic. The first is the duty. What about the bank letter of credit? What about the foreign currency exchange? Different mode of transportation. How long does it take to reach my product from the country South Africa to the Australia or any other country and about international documentation? So these are the new parameters. We can say the new dimension we need to learn when we talk about the international marketing research. The second most important aspect is the environmental factors. If we talk about environmental factors, it includes pastel analysis, political factor, economical factor, technological factor, legal factor, and culture factors. So a management need to know about the culture of the host countries. What about the main religious? The people are Hinduism, the people are the Christian. What are the religious, the people where you planning to start a business? Understand the political system. Who is the ruling party? What about the pressure of the political party when it's come to the exchange of the product and services? The comprehensive existence different in societal structure languages. 
what about the people social class what about the people income level what about the gdp of the country as well as the local language as well as the national language when we talk about environmental factors advertisement play a very important role how do you select the advertisement in in terms of message in terms of image and in terms of the reach here i would like to highlight a one concept called segmentation target and positioning how good you are to segment your product target and about the positioning of your product and obviously understand the legal issue now a competition play a very important and it is a very essential to study a level of competition also in the area of marketing management and strategic management each businessman very essential to understand a potter's five force model which will provide you what are the bargaining powers of the buyers about the suppliers about the existence and many others so the international marketing exposed the firm much greater varieties of the competition than the found in a home market the firm must understand the competitive activities what about the price difference between your versus your competitors and the answer is competitive advantage what unique your product what unique your service is compared to your competitors whether your location is your competitive advantage your price is your competitive advantage or your brand reputation citizenship behavior anything can be a part of the competitive advantage and evaluate the actual and potential impact on a company's operating ongoing process to study a competition it's a ongoing process you have to develop a unique research and development which can carry a research activities on a time to time basis international consumer buying research so consumer behavior is a behavior of consumer at the time of purchase decision here i would like to highlight what are the factors play a very vital important role in terms of consumer behavior a brand preference some people would like to go with the branded products like a reebok like a nike or a mercedes or a audi as well as the brand awareness consumer purchase behavior Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it seems if we've lost Dr. Cadrodio there, but but already on international marketing, I've I've made a few notes here just on segmentation, targeting, and positioning. The the wealth of research you need to go through in order to position yourself and to breach that international market. It's astounding. I've I've seen a comment here as well uh, of someone saying it's uh, it's there's a lot more to it. uh then what you would just dream of you know taking your business uh on an international uh scale uh we have uh, a time for three quick comments so i'd like our panel to uh, uh to be quick about it when they respond any takers on the clicks advert any comments there there are definitely different uh, perceptions on this uh i think clicks stepped up and they took responsibility Uh, but i think the major learning point uh, out of this whole situation is just highlighting the importance of field testing your adverts with all cultural groups especially in a country like south africa thank you so much dr mella uh, uh short and sweet and uh, to the point thank you so much we appreciate it uh yonita one last question coming your way uh how do you stand out in in this environment uh, uh, just a a quick uh, recommendation from your side 
Yeah, but I think um, listening to everybody's conversations, um, I've identified a golden thread today. And I think it is to combine some behavior and it's about emotions and the experiences. And I believe that if we understand what emotional impact our brand will have on our target audience, we are halfway towards real marketing success. And I think a way to stand out in times like these, we don't, um, we, we shouldn't use push marketing. We should be focusing on our clients' needs and listening to what they really want and how to stay real towards our brand as well as our um, target audience. And just to give you an example from the um, Porch Chamber of Commerce side, um, during the lockdown, they implemented a Pro Porch initiative that focused on um, supporting local because we found that there was a need for companies to um, prosper ec economically and um, we wanted to encourage the Port of Stream community to think and buy and sell and enjoy local and that is a way you create brand awareness and that is a way to stand out from the crowd um, and to use something else than just marketing your products and your services and using push marketing to get Somewhere. So much, uh, Ioannita, I appreciate it. We uh, signaled, the signal broke up a little bit, but we, we got the gist of it. Thank you so much. Dr. Miller, you see that uh, once we start opening up on this and, and have conversations, I think we can talk uh, for hours on this. It's fascinating. And the ideas and, and best practice, the recommendations that you and all the other experts make are truly uh, uh, fascinating. Uh, this is also a wonderful field to study in. Uh, please tell us a little bit more on the postgraduate offering that we have in, in marketing management at the NWU. At the Northwest University, we've got an honours in marketing management. It's a new program starting next year. It used to be entrepreneurship and marketing, so next year it's uh, purely marketing honours. From there, you can do your master's in marketing management and then obviously your PhD in marketing management. Applications are open, as Mia said in her presentation. If you want to apply, be quick about it. We are going to look at applications in October. But if you're interested in marketing management, please, please contact us. Visit our website and get your application in. Thank you so much, uh, Rian, Dr. Muller, thank you for your participation and what you brought to the table and starting off this webinar. Also a huge thank you to our other participants, uh, Dr. Roland Goldberg, you opened up uh, worlds for us with your uh, very interesting uh, focus area of research. Uh, Dr. Mia Botma, thank you for your insights. Uh, it's wonderful to, to hear your views on it and you're truly an expert on this. Uh, customer citizenship thing. And then also uh, to Dr. Ankit Katradia. Uh, 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 it's incredible. You work within a wonderful field that is far more complex uh, than one normally would, would just think about, one, one would wish. And then you realize before you run, it's uh, better to get that uh, R&D department up and running before you get into the international market. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our webinar. Uh, and uh, we'd also like to thank you, uh, thank the, from the NWU side, uh, thank the Portchester Chamber of Commerce. You're always willing partners, and it's wonderful uh, to work with you. Uh, the Deputy President, Ioannita uh, Greiling, uh, thank you for your time, uh, taking uh, the time out of your busy schedule. Uh, good luck with your work in Cape Town and also all the, the work that you do on a national level. We appreciate your contributions as well. Contact us, ladies and gentlemen. It is time to become more. Do your postgraduate degree.